Well, here we go. Second attempt. We'll see if this one is successful. Uh, I say second attempt, really, it's like third or fourth time trying to come up here and get this done. But, you know, these are hardworking guys. Uh, I'm just glad they're going to let me in to get a look at this. This morning you saw I brought them a big old bag of McDonald's and a box of coffee. And, uh, that, you know, always helps things out. I'm sure they're going to fit me in. Um, I'm going to cut this big, big old truck off here real quick. That's really fun. And uh, anyway, yeah, bag of McDonald's. Not very personal. Uh, I wish I could have brought them like a cooler full of fish or some shark fillets or uh, a hind quarter of venison or some grizzly bear stew that I, you know, killed with my own bare hands or something because <laughs> they put a lot of their skin into their work. And uh, I don't know, I'm a little bit early. And sure enough, I walk in the door, and what do I find? They're loading my block into the Sun and CV-616. The cylinder. For those of you who are new here, my pistons fit in my block, but not for how I'm going to be using it. They're the factory specs for the factory forged piston materials, and for their stock boost, stock fuel consumption use. These specifications are completely useless to me. I started out with two and two and a half thousandths of an inch piston to cylinder wall clearance in all four bores with these pistons, which would be loose by factory standards, but it's well short of what I really needed simply because I'm not using the factory pistons. So that's why we're here today. You see that? I wasn't lying. We really are at Ballast Machine. We managed to pull this off today. So today we're going to do the bores and on the uh, on the cylinders, and right here we've got a set of JE20 overbore pistons and. I said before that uh, they weren't going to need my measurements or anything, but we checked them out and uh, yeah, some variation. It could be my tools, who knows. But right here they've already got everything measured out. That's all the pistons. There's the crankshaft measurements. And first what we do is we start off by zeroing a bore gauge to the piston diameter. Here's the bore gauge. Yay! And it's all jigged up in this thing for a reference. How does this thing work? We set our, our setting fixture at the size we want, which is 3.361, which is our active piston diameter. Then we zero our gauge to that dimension around the front. All right. Cool. And we'll just take that over to the block. We'll go to number one cylinder. We've got our torque plate installed. And we'll show that as of right now, we're showing about two and a half thousandths of actual clearance. Uh, above our piston. Mm -hmm. uh, the next steps we'll make is we'll hone the block to get the desired clearance. Alright, so we've got our uh, sun and hone set up. We've got our stroke length set. We've got our bore gauges set. Uh, what we're going to do next is uh, we need to take about a thousandth out of these bores to get the desired clearance. Uh, so we'll go ahead and set up and do that now. Cool. So we've gone from about two and a half thousandths to right at three. So we've still got about a half thousandths to go. I think we're just quick. Still got a couple of tenths to go. Just like that, we have a desired clearance. 35-35. Now we'll move on to the next cylinder. So there you have the process. I figured that I'd shut up and just let you see it once through in real time. Two things that I never seem to do. It's pretty simple. Calibrate, measure, cut, measure. Rinse, repeat until you sneak up on all of your targets. This machine makes your target bore diameters nice and easy to sneak up on because you're doing it one hole at a time. This example will demonstrate a lesson that will mean more later in this video or as you get older in life. I promise. Speaking of holes, I could fall in a hole watching machine work videos on YouTube. Now imagine you're doing this 8,000 times a month while trying to maintain your eye for detail. 
Machinists are a special breed. I can't say enough about everyone's disposition in here. This kind of repetition would wear thin on me pretty dang quick. And I have most people believing that I have patience. Every time I come in here, this machine is running. If it's not, it's getting set up to cut a different thing. But for the decades that I've been in and out of here, it never rests while the shop is open. You can hear it in all four corners of the building. Honing is life. Tom, do you have your temperature gun? Yeah. There's a lot of people who question what ambient temperature can do to affect cylinder size, cylinder condition. Like you didn't see that button. We're currently about 74, 75 degrees. You'll notice that this bore, after just touching it for just a couple of short strokes, is up around 78, 79. Mm -hmm. um, that can affect bore condition a couple of tenths in some cases, depending on the thickness of the cylinder wall. So it's always best to hone, let it relax, let the temperature kind of equalize itself, and then remeasure and then adjust accordingly. Thank you, Stuart. That concludes the topic of thermal expansion. I illustrated in my previous segment about how most metals expand approximately six millionths of an inch per inch of material per one degree Fahrenheit. Well, machining parts requires friction and therefore it generates heat. Over the span of six inches of material, including the holes, a 10 degree temperature difference will certainly show up in the 10,000th spot of a measurement. A machinist has to deal with localized heat because they generate it, but the assemblers don't have to deal with it because their parts are all acclimated from being stored in the same place. We're starting with the bores with about two and a half thousandths clearance. Of course, this is uh, not the desired clearance that we want. We'd like to have it a little bit looser because this is going to be a heavily boosted engine. And the... So we're going to take about a thousandth out of these bores. That's about one eighth of the thickness of one sheet of notebook paper all the way around the circumference of each one. It's a mind-bendingly minuscule amount of material to have to be concerned with, but that piston to cylinder wall clearance is absolutely critical in the larger scheme of things. You don't want them too big, but you definitely don't ever want to run out of it. As you can see, we've only removed a couple of tents. We've gone from about two and a half to about two eight. That's getting closer. It will affect your engine's longevity, its final compression ratios, crankcase pressure, oil quality, and even emissions. So choose wisely. Follow the directions for your piston materials. That's all the science there is behind doing this correctly. Just think about how you're gonna use it, and if performance is the goal, it's okay to be a little bit loose on your piston to cylinder wall clearance. About three and two tenths, so just a couple more strokes. <clears throat> That'll bring us right to our desired clearance of three and a half thousandths. This extra clearance we added should make these pistons really happy in their new holes. So what we'll do now is we'll let the block kind of relax and let the temperatures equalize. Uh, we'll come back and check it in just a few. Awesome. Thanks, man. If you look at the spec sheet for my 4032 Alloy JE pistons, they recommend two to two and a half thousandths minimum clearance for thermal expansion of this alloy on a normally aspirated build. The instructions specifically state in step four to add clearance for supercharged, turbocharged, nitrous, and or marine use. This is because when you're cramming more air in to burn more fuel and make more power, the side effect is you make more heat. I needed it to be at least a thousandth larger than minimum spec, and now it is. I'd have added more if I used this car for road race or endurance racing, but it's a gasoline burning street strip engine that's more likely to win car shows and hurt feelings than it is to ever compete in racing events. It's not the only thing that I'm here to correct though. My engine's main bore clearances were not consistent, and this cap grinder can be used for mains, rods, and even camshaft caps in an effort to bring them back into spec. Stuart's about to explain how this is going to work. All right, so now we're going to move on to the step of cutting our main caps down. Uh, we've measured our block, found that we need to reduce our main bearing housing bore size to the bottom of the specification. Uh, so we're going to start that process by removing the caps from the block. Uh, we're going to bring them over here to our sun and rod cap cutter and remove two to three thousandths, uh, reducing that housing bore size, which will then allow us to come back and run our line hone bar through the, through the main bearing bores, making them round again and reducing the size by just a couple thousandths. We made 
made a pass of a couple thousandths and we'll see that we've got a nice clean surface. We've got a little bit of workage on one corner. So we'll put it back in and uh, remove a couple more thousandths so we get a, a clean, true, flat surface across the cap. Six bolt 4G63 mains are bridged on the one, two, and the four and the five journals. So they don't fit into the cap grinders. Those had to be clamped and milled on a bridge port to remove a couple of thousandths evenly. After the caps that needed to be shortened were cut, I bolted them all back into the block with the bearing girdle, followed the same torque and lubrication procedures that I'll be using in the final assembly. Once this is achieved, Stuart's gonna make the baseline cut to ensure that the bores are straight and true and then get a measurement for our starting point. This machine doesn't offer the same precision that the cylinder hone does. It's less perfect of a process because ultimately you will be relying on bearing crush to provide the end results and you're also having to cut all of the mains simultaneously. Uh, we are tightening up some main bearing clearances today. We have gone through and cut our bearing caps to decrease the housing bore size. Uh, we're now taking our sun and line hone we're going to go back through and we're going to true up those bores. Uh, our goal is to shrink those housing bores by about a thousandths to tighten up our main bearing clearance. We've already made our cuts on our caps. We've made an initial pass with our honing mandrel. Now we're going to measure it for size to check our progress. All in all, we're looking pretty good so far for an initial cut. Uh, we're about four thousandths under our main bearing housing bore spec, so we got a little ways to go. We're going to set up and hone a little bit more out. Uh, we've made a couple of passes with our honing mandrel. Uh, we're going to recheck progress and see what we've accomplished. All right, so we've taken about a thousand out of our bores. We've still got a little bit to go. decrease in bearing points isn't always exponential so unfortunately sometimes yeah you take it apart put your bearings in and you go well that didn't give me the desired result <laughs> I didn't realize how strong the foreshadowing was going to be on that statement but you're about to find out well now it's back to you all right so I get to bust this thing apart and put some bearings in it good time Correct. main bores aren't actually round and this is intentional milling the caps makes them ever so slightly less round. By design, the main bores are supposed to be wider horizontally, and this shape is critical for controlling oil film layer and for achieving the proper bearing crush. After all, it's bearing crush that gives a bearing its load strength and helps it stay put inside the bore. Milling the caps a couple of thousandths won't significantly change the size of the bore's horizontal axis so much as it will its vertical axis. This machine restores the roundness again for the vertical axis of the bore. What Stuart explained, which I referred to as foreshadowing, means that this is a trial and error process. Bearing crush is less predictable than simply cutting and making an exact measurement of a hole. So I had to break the block down and reinstall bearings, then remeasure them, and if they're not right, remove them again, retorquing everything and repeating this process until we achieved the results we wanted. Little did I realize that this would be what I'd be doing for the next seven hours. Yeah, I don't really have all my voice back and that's gonna kind of suck for the voiceover. But, anywho, um, I am on my way back to the machine shop again. On the first day, I got to do that mains torquing procedure nine different times and I still went home without my block because after all that, it still wasn't right. It's been more than a month before our schedules could realign and grant us another opportunity to work together on finishing it up. Better luck on day two, maybe. 
I guess we're gonna find out. Previously, we had four out of five correct. It didn't help that the number five crankshaft journal is a half thousand smaller than the rest of the journals, and it ended up going way oversized despite our efforts to prevent it. Stuart reground the caps while I was away, and as soon as I got back, I did a Jaffro style cleanup of all my parts, reassembled it, loaded it back into the line boring machine, and we went for another round. The foreshadowing was very real. We're trying to hit 2.2 to 2.3 thousandths of an inch on every main journal because of the power levels I'm aiming for. At this stage, we're starting over. We're tight on all five and trying to bring them back up again. All right, have at it. My turn. Your turn. All right. I get to blow the assembly apart, install the main bearings again, retorque as per procedure, and then turn it right back over to Stuart for measuring and checking out our progress. Off of, off number five? Well, actually, yeah, if we gain, no, we're set off of, uh, we need to recalibrate it for number five. So our number five main journal is a half a thousand smaller than number one through four. So we'll readjust our bore gauge. Okay. Okay. Flip it, little sucker. So while number two, three, and five were almost right, we're still really tight on numbers one and four. You know what that means again. That's right, my turn. Break it down, take the bearings out, retorque everything, and get ready for Stuart to do another round of honing again. You're about to run this. Spent all day on this again and uh, creeping up on it at ten thousandth at a time. In the very last pass, it jumped a half thousandth, and now we're completely, yeah, it's starting over again. So that's how it goes. If you're looking for perfection, sometimes you have to do it more than once. So we'll try again in a little bit. Oh well, maybe after Thanksgiving. Speaking of Thanksgiving, it's Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. In the previous scenes, you saw me messing with my block, but in this scene, it's not Thanksgiving anymore. It's Christmas Eve. We're gonna do this as many times as necessary to get it right. It's nice to be able to celebrate so many holidays with you. I got my sack full of diabetes here. I'm gonna give everybody diabetes for Christmas. Got a sack of bagels. Anyway, I look forward to getting this all wrapped up. My goal this third day was to get my block back before the holiday to clean it up, size all my rings, and get back to assembly while I'm off work. It's important to have expectations or else you'll never truly know disappointment. At the end of day two, as the results of our efforts grew less consistent, I got suspicious about some of my parts. My frustration made me a little bit sloppy too. Day two is long gone and I didn't tell you about this, so I have a confession. Now what I didn't tell you is I got a new set of ARPs and a new set of bearings. And the reason why I got a new set of bearings is because I hosed it bad right there. It happens. It doesn't matter what the part is. Everyone in this building's done it before. My ARP studs either wore out or got contaminated, so I'm glad to be replacing all these things that I screwed up. We shaved down all the main caps again that went oversized during our previous attempt. 
And now that the new studs are installed, we're going to recheck our baseline for the main bores again. Because I bought new bearings, we're also going to need to measure those just to ensure that the new bearings aren't far off from where the old ones were. I could immediately feel a difference between the new and the old studs. It's said that ARP studs are reusable, and they are. There's still a limit to that rule. You can stretch them by over-torquing them, or gall the threads from contamination or by using the wrong lubricant. What the? There's something wrong. You did see that, didn't you? You did catch that. 4B11H. 4B11H is a DSM 6 volt rod bearing. I needed main bearings. I looked at my receipt. It said 4B11H. That was my fault. So I get to come back next year on January 2nd and do this again. January 2nd came and went. It's the 17th now. To shoot this video, I had to coordinate all forward progress on my block with my day job, the machine shop's business hours, their busy schedule, shipping delays, and of course my own screw-ups. I'm sure they're tired of seeing me by now. In addition to the holidays, I'm burning my fifth vacation day to shoot this video. A burnt offering to the gods of speed that's probably going to interfere with how many fish I get to catch this year. Alright, seventh attempt. It's incredible the impact and long-reaching effects that ordering the wrong part can have. I'm very aware that these are all YouTuber with a day job problems, but including my colossal screw-ups, these are the kinds of things that I will share and that I'll sacrifice for views and likes on YouTube. I knew this block was going to be a problem child. I changed crankshafts, baked it twice, had all kinds of taper on the mains, and the wrong size cylinder bores. If that wasn't enough, I'm also the guy that wanted to have a bearing girdle installed. A competent machinist can make dang near anything fit or work, it's just a matter of time associated with making that happen. Sometimes it comes easy, and sometimes it doesn't. This is one of those jobs where it doesn't. Seventh time. Seven. I've been doing business with Ballast Machine for over 20 years and built four engines with them, so I completely trust them. Seven. They've always been very patient with me, as you can tell. They also understand the value of what this means to me to be able to bring and share this process with you, and I'm so happy they let me do this again. I'm really lucky. Six was my fault. Most customers get to drop their stuff off, tell them what they want, and receive a call when it's ready to pick up to pay their bill. The customer doesn't get to film anything, do any of the work, or distract the rest of the crew. Stuart prophetically warned all of us that this process can be exactly like this, and it has been. That was the voice of experience. Stuart set our expectations correctly and accurately, so naturally I'm pretty happy with how this is turning out. We're back. It's been almost a month since anything changed and we had to take a minute to figure out where we left off. Heck, I edited this video and I even forgot where we were. But I suppose it doesn't hurt to measure twice for the 20th time if it helps us remember. Yeah, I'd run with it, bro. I'd run with it. Yeah. Yep. Okay, where we left off, the mains had already been cut and honed, and I had just installed new ARPs. It needed new standard bearings because I destroyed one of the old ones. One thing that really impressed me through all this work is how tough the baked on Glyptol coating is. I beat these main caps loose with plastic hammers dozens of times and doing this job again and again, and it didn't budge. It's pretty clear that I'm not done failing though. I didn't hurt it, I just added more cleaning to the process. Fresh out of assembly cloths, I used red rags on it this time around. You already know my opinion of that, and I'm just mentioning it so that you don't have to. I was really careful, I promise. I have the right bearings this time. I also developed some other time-saving habits along the way, like knocking the mains back into place with a dead blow hammer instead of doing double duty with the fasteners. The smart among us will learn to change ourselves instead of making our own lives more difficult. With the studs, they can't seat crooked, so I just saved some time with the hammer. If anything good came from line honing this thing so many times using the same torque procedure and bearing girdle, it's that there's absolutely zero taper on any of these mains now. They're all straight, no question. The reused ARPs being retorqued so many times caused them to show their age and force me to replace them, which I probably should have done from the very beginning. But now I've got a set that's only been torqued once. If that was the root of any of this difficulty, then I'm the guilty party here, because I supplied that part. 
With the bearing girdle reinstalled and the new bearings in place, let's get this thing measured again and see if these changes along with the last pass did the trick. Alright, we're back here today. We've got the right set of bearings installed in uh, our 4G63 uh, engine today for Jaffro. Uh, we're ready to check some clearances. Our line hone has been done. We have the correct set of bearings. So here we go. Good, we're going to move to the next position. Alright, we can see here we're a little over on this one. Yep. Dang. Can't win them all, so we're going to move on to our next position. Here we are, back on our spec. Sweet. I like to see. So move to the number four position. tenth of our number three, which is great. Nice. We're going to take a minute and go reset our bore gauge for our number five main. All right, here we are correcting our bore gauge for our number five main bearing. All right. All right, so we've reset our gauge to our number five, uh, taking into account the variance on our number five journal. So, here we go. All right. Everything looks great with the exception of the number two main. Uh, and we've decided at this point what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and order us a set of one under mains uh, and install that to correct our clearance. So here we are on the number one side. We recalibrated the dial board gauge and just decided to do this again. And these are the numbers we came up with. There's the big one, the number two. And we're done cutting. That's over. I get to take this home. Day seven, yay! Excellent, well, we'll catch up in a bit. So did you fully follow that? I'm gonna need one oversized bearing in order to correct my oil clearances. I know the factory service manual says not to do that, and it's great whenever it works out with just one standard set, but even the factory doesn't follow their own advice. There are casting and machining processes that can lead to variations in these measurements. The factory machinists stamp notes into the block to let the assembler know about it, since he's the guy that's gonna have to handle it next and correct them. Right here you can see that my block was born crooked. There's a row of stamps for the mains and one for the rods. This is indelible proof that even the factory does it. So don't be surprised when you install new standard bearings with all the same parts and things somehow don't come out right. It's not the end of the world and it doesn't mean that your block is junk. A competent machinist can correct it. You just need to get your block line honed to ensure the mains are straight and get them as close as you can to the specification that you need. The important thing is that the oil clearances are correct because it's the oil that holds up your crankshaft, not the bearings. Better side to lay down. Thank you, man. No problem. It's pretty awesome. I'm so glad to have it. Really. Now you can actually do something with it. Now I can go fail at home instead of having to fail in front of you guys. <laughs> So again, I'm sorry about the delay. I'm more concerned with doing this job right and finishing off the topic than I am with giving piecemeal updates just for the sake of uploading. This is the eighth block prep video after all, and I hope that our efforts help anyone who has the wrong size pistons or gets their mains all up in a bunch. Big enormous shout out goes to Ballast Machine for letting 100,000 people raid their refrigerators and use their restroom. An equally big shout out goes out to all the people on Patreons who keep all the channel's lights on and the parts rolling in for future videos. If you want to join the people who watch my videos first that you see scrolling by at the end, well there you go, the link's in the description. Subscribe if you're a new one, you can give me a big ol' thumbs up for all the vacation days. That probably saved a whole lot of fish, so you'd be doing the environment a favor too. Don't forget to tell us what you think in the comments, and until next time, stay tubed.